Hi everyone, my name is Asanda Mbaimbai. I am with the citizen at the Brocons Bridge Police Station. So, so today we are with Mr. Willy Fosher, who is a forensic pathologist and who is going to take us through the journey of their day-to-day -day lives and the challenges they face. Uh, good morning. Uh, yes, I'm uh, Willy Fosher. I'm the facility manager here at Forensic Pathology Service from Kushpreit. Um, yes, thank you for telling me that I'm a pathologist. I would love to be there. Um, but um, I'm actually a, a facility manager and I would like to call myself a death investigator or a forensic death investigator. Um, my daily uh, task here is to ensure that the quality of service that is rendered uh, to the public, uh, to the relatives and even to the deceased is of the highest standard in the world. Uh, that includes uh, visiting crime scenes, uh, collecting deceased that has passed away from unnatural causes of death or sudden unexpected deaths, and then uh, ensuring that that process is followed up to the book um, to produce a report to the justice system uh, to get closure, firstly to the families, and then maybe if there is a suspect, to get the suspect, and then to get the cause of death. Uh, all in working with uh, extra the members, uh, with pathologists as well, and even the police. So we have lots of stakeholders that is currently uh, we are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so Mr. Billy, can you tell us more about this job? What does it entail and what are the challenges that you face day-to-day? Um, Okay, um, like I said, um, we uh, get uh, activated by the SAPS. So uh, let me just give you a bit of a background of Forensic Pathology Service. We were previously, uh, the service was run by the South African Police Service. In 2006, uh, it, this service was handed over to Health uh, due to um, the um, Tooth and Reconciliation Committee and um, the Human Rights Commission said that police cannot investigate themselves and they decided then to move it over to health. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis we collect and are called to scenes by the SAPS of unnatural cases of death uh, that will include uh, car accidents, uh, homicides, suicides, um, any unsuspected, uh, suspected uh, uh, any deaths that is uh, sudden or unexpected. Also, uh, at other facilities, they collect disease from hospitals that dies due to anesthetic deaths. Um, we then go to that scenes, be the eyes and the ears of the pathologist, to get all necessary information, so that when the body then comes to, to the mortuary and a post-mortem is conducted, the cause of death can be determined. Um, after that, we uh, collect the body, um, in a dignified manner, put it in a body bag, bring the body to our facility, uh, capture basic information like length and weight uh, and clothing and attaching then a, a body number, a unique body number. After that uh, the pathologist will then after uh, a few days will then come and uh, conduct a post-mortem. Uh, while then after that uh, the process of identification will also start with the families coming to view the loved ones, doing the paperwork and after that uh, releasing the body to the family so that they can then do the processes of bringing the body. So why is the post-mortem not done immediately? Why do you guys have to wait for a short period of time before it can be done? Um, that's a very good question because people think a post-mortem must be done right there and then. The thing is, um, we want all relevant information before we can conduct a post-mortem. Because, uh, like I tell the families, our evidence do not lie. But we need to, to get the whole picture before we start with the post-mortem. Say, for instance, with uh, an aesthetic death. Uh, the person comes from the hospital. The doctor doesn't know. There's no crime scene. So we don't know what the circumstances, what, what was the previous cause and how many anesthetic was given to this. So the pathologist needs that file to peruse through that file to say, okay, what test will I then perform on this body so that we can say, okay, 
maybe this person was over anesthetic or, or it was a natural case. So um, it is actually to, to better the process and to get to the correct course of death. So that we do not, do not lie at the end of the day and just haphazardly say yes. And if we release that body and we didn't take the right samples and it, the other, other evidence comes out, it's gone. So that will actually hamper the, 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 uh, the true cause of death at the end of the day. So the biggest um, question most people have is what is the difference between a forensic investigator and a pathologist? Because people seem, seem, seem to be mixing a lot of those. Okay. Um, a forensic uh, death investigator, or uh, how we call uh, uh, the forensic officers, is, is, like I said, is the eyes and the ears of the pathologist. They are the ones that bring all this information that is critical uh, from the scene. They are the ones that are supporting the pathologists. Uh, even at, at, at uh, post-mortem, the, the forensic officers assist with the dissection of, of the body, opening the, the body and doing dissection, uh, taking off samples, um, and also uh, then doing the identification process because the pathologist is not there to do the identification process. But the pathologist is there. He's a trained doctor that's studied. So he then uh, specialized in forensic pathology or in pathology. Uh, you get different pathologies because sometimes people think we are AMPA, but we are not AMPA. We are forensic pathology. Uh, and there's a huge difference, but the, 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 why they call it pathology is to look into, you know, to look deeper into. So that is the difference between a, a forensic officer and a pathologist. What are the challenges that you face um, on your day-to-day -day job? Um, on our day-to-day -day job, uh, we get challenges on scenes. Um, because we go to um, crime scenes, sometimes it can be a risk. A risky uh, a mob uh, that people are, that are angry uh, about this guy that died now. Or they don't want this guy to be removed. So um, our, our members is in, in sometimes a hazardous place. And then when there's crowds around the, the, the crime scene, it hampers our, our work because we want to have dignity for that deceased. And then we have to chase away the people and say, please, let us just do our job so that we can have just dignity to the, this was is still a person. You know, um, and yes, uh, we, we get to traumatize uh, families on scenes or when they come to, to our facilities. We have to um, keep our cool to give them the, the space to, 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 to mourn and, and to go through that trauma. Uh, so, so that's actually a, a challenge. Um, and yes, uh, on a day-to-day -day thing, that, that is challenges like... Uh, uh, not enough staff, you know, um, overburdening of, of uh, especially at huge big facilities. Um, you know, uh, I'm a small facility. I do in a year what other facilities do in a month. So they are actually overburdened. Mm. Yeah. Wow. And do you guys receive any form of counseling from when you guys come from the crime scene and it is a terrible scene for you? You can't process it in the correct way. How do you guys deal with the pressure? of what you come across at the crime scene? Um, there is a, a we, we've got a good support system from our head office. Uh, we've got a, a psychologist uh, appointed uh, in our, our forensic pathology service. Um, so there's good support there, but members, you know, it's there, but do members use it? We don't know. I don't, I don't think, uh, you know, it's like cowboys don't cry. Um, but yes, how I deal with, with, with cases like that is um, thinking about the outcome. Yes, you, you, and, and when you are finished with the scene, you forget it. Your mind goes and you forget it. You go to the next scene. Because you think as it, you want to be a voice for this voiceless. You uh, must see this person's family and tell them that this is what happened. Give, give that guy the last voice so that family can get the closure at the end of the day. So that, that's, how, that's how I'm uh, coping with stressful information or stressful stuff. Most of the time, it's not the dead that, that, that bothers or gives us challenges, it's the living. 
uh, family members fighting about bodies, saying, no, I'm the wife, I must release the, I must, and no, I'm the brother, and my culture say, I must take over the, the arrangement, and we must sort that things out, and, and explain to the families that uh, we cannot get involved, please, can you get, uh, um, uh, you know, can you, can you just, just get along so that this person can be buried? Um, you know, uh, what, what actually frustrates me is that people do not respect their own dead. What fascinates you about this job? Everything. You know, um, one, one day in, 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 in church, the pastor asked everybody, do you like, love you, like your job? Do you love your job? Do you and I was the only one that raised my hand. <laughs> and everybody laughed. And they said, what you are dealing with the dead? I said, yes, because the dead never complains. Um, it's the only place in life where everybody is equal. It doesn't matter how many money you have. How many, what did you do? You must also be in that coffin if you did. You know, and, and the deceased can never steal from you. He can never swear at you. Can the deceased beat you? No, but people are afraid of the day, but you know, if you treat them with respect, um, they can never say thank you. So it's like, you know, that, 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 is, that is how I, that's how passionate I'm about <laughs> this job. It, it fasc I, our pathologists say that we are actually so favorable that we are working with the most, in the, the precious uh, stone of, of God's creation, the human body. Uh, that is, that is that's just amazing if if you can work you know with with that it's, it's on a day to day basis and and then like I said giving a voice to that deceased so do you guys have enough storage places while you guys wait for the post mortem to be conducted mm. um yes uh we we do have enough storage um space um but on a in a blink of an eye, that storage space can be depleted because a mass disaster can happen, like what happened in, 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 in Boxburg the other day. So, um, yes, we are actually overpopulated currently because we are struggling to, to, to bury our um, unidentified or unclaimed bodies because the municipalities are, um, because it's their uh, mandate to bury these bodies that we are, are keeping and they don't, don't have funding for it. And they don't have space for it. So we, we give them uh, letters, and then they say, But we are storing. Are you still fine? Yes. So then, then we're not coming to click. So that, that's a the huge problem for us. Um, uh, but we, we currently have enough storage. So we, even with COVID, what, what happened is we actually installed extra storage space um, at some facilities, even at hospitals. It was part of our projects to, to increase the capacity at the end of the day. Yes. So, in terms of um, the body decomposing, mm. how, how long does it take for the body to decompose from the day you guys um, fetched it from the crime scene to the day of the postmortem and to the day of the burial? Okay. So, decomposition is, is, a, is actually a very interesting uh, um, part of our investigation. Um, decomposition starts directly actually after you passed away because your cells start to, to break down because you don't have any oxygen. Um, then you uh, start to decolorize after three days and uh, some gases start on, that's now outside on the scene. But it depends on how we get the deceased from, from the scene. Um, we then take the body into the, our fridges. On the right temperature, that body do not decay further. Uh, it, it slows the, the, the fridges, if it's between zero and five, it slows down the decay of, of, of that um, decomposition. It, it doesn't stop it, it just slows it down. Because, and then sometimes we, we put that body that is uh, decomposed maybe in the freezer to, to, to reduce it more. So if, if your fridges are correct and um, the temperatures are correct, the decomposition slows down, it's not decomposed, but it depends on how you collect the body from the sea. Um, we, we have now uh, actually had 
quite two interesting cases where people come from hospitals that actually um, had some some falls and, and stuff and we, we picked up that due to the falls that I took and that is not a scientific proof but I would like to, to do a, a, a study around that um, they, they actually increased decomposing due maybe because of the the, the stuff that they had in their body you know uh, maybe the, the uh, blood pressure falls or, or anesthesia or, or anything that, that is different from normal blood because what decomposes in your body is, is your blood first your blood starts decomposing and then it goes out to, to all the other parts of, of your uh, body yes. wow so there have been rumors going around mm. you, you know that sometimes it happens that when the body is inside the fridge mm. it twitches or it just moves are those rumors true or false um no they, they are not true <laughs> but what i can explain to you is when a person passes away rigor mortis starts coming in so rigor mortis is is, is where your, your body starts stiffening and your uh, joints and everything starts pulling together so then you'll get that the guy is very stiff and then after 12 hours it then decreases again and then the body starts relaxing mm -hmm. and um, when the body is in the fridge um, it actually um, dehydrates all the tendons and stuff dehydrates so you'll get that your when your hands is open now suddenly your hands will just move a bit but that's because of a dehydration oh. of the tendons yes okay yeah so it's it, the, the body will not not twitch or i just thought as much that when a person is dead they are dead declared dead so how can that happen yeah wow. so 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 that is it's because you you still got water in your in your body you are 80 percent water so the more water that is going out of your body the more your then it, it shortens or yeah, so it, it, it will, will, will not, uh, a body do not twitch or move by itself. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and you see the thing is, people think that everybody is just a number. Right? But here at my facility, I teach my people that it's still a loved one or something. Mm. It's not just a number. Treat that body with respect as you would have treated your loved ones. Yeah. Thank you so much, Vicky. Thank you so much. So, guys, yes, um, this is our storage facility. Uh, this is where we now, from the scene, comes and we then put the, the bodies inside. On this trace, inside a body bag that is marked uh, on a cold storage between 0 and 5. Uh, currently, we can store 12 bodies in this. Uh, temporary storage and then we also have a uh, long-term storage outside that the temperature is between 0 and minus 20 where we store our long-term storage that is for people that are maybe um, decomposed or uh, that we cannot trace the families then we store them there up until we can trace the families.